Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's lunchtime lecture. Uh, I'm Paul McMillan, I'm a member of the lunchtime lecture committee and I'm the, I'm the host for today. So uh, before we begin, could I please ask you to check to make sure that your mobile telephones are switched off or on to silent, thank you. So today's lecture is, uh, is given by Dr. Christian Bomer, who's uh, a lecturer in the mathematics department at UCL. He has a background in theoretical physics and has been moving into uh, theories of continuum mechanics. And that's led him to develop some new ideas about uh, relativity, Einstein, and gravity. So, Christian. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction and thank you very much for deciding to spend the lunch hour here today. So, the aim of this talk is give you a bit of an idea of what my research is about, and that is very difficult because people like me, we like to write very long equations, and ideally we like to hide behind these equations and the standard statement is look at the equation and work it out for yourself. So unfortunately today I'm not allowed to do this because if I write down one very long equation then there are not very many people who would appreciate that very much. So I need to give you a bit of a, of a historical overview of why I do what I do and I try to sort of motivate why we humans in general do these kinds of activities which in my case is theoretical physics but very much motivated by, in parts at least by astrophysics, I would say. So what I want to talk about is I want to give you a little bit of a short overview of, of gravity, of the theory of gravity, and what we have done over the last few thousand years to come to the theory that we now call gravity. And I think the best way to start this is if you go back a few thousand years, people were always really interested in, in the night sky. And I think all of you have done this at some point. It was very dark. You went outside and you looked up in the sky and you found it terribly fascinating. And this is a fascination that I think humans have, have shared for thousands, ten thousands of years probably. And this is what has motivated us to develop theories and develop an understanding of, of the night sky, I suppose. And if you look back, I think the Babylonians were the first ones to be quite serious about um, astronomy and astro well, and astronomy, observational astronomy, I should say. And I'll show you a few pictures about this in a minute. But I will also talk about so general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of relativity that he proposed in 1916, and that fundamentally changed our view of the gravitational force. And as the host said, I've recently moved, so over the last few years, I also worked in continuum mechanics. So what, what is this continuum mechanics? It's not something that you, that you learn in school. So continuum mechanics is about modeling um, materials, and you don't want to model them as point particles stuck together. You want to model them as, a, as one continuous medium. A good example is an elastic rubber band. If you try to model an elastic rubber band by individual points, um, that doesn't quite work. So the molecules are stuck together and they sort of function as a continuous medium. And one of the very important aspects of continuum mechanics, as this rubber band indicates, is something that people call elasticity. So where you study the bending of objects. And if you think this is sort of highly academic, it's actually terribly important. A very good example for a very useful application of this elasticity theory is, for instance, if you build aeroplanes. So the next time you get onto an aeroplane, watch the wings of an aeroplane during takeoff, for instance. They're not static. They actually flap very gently. The flapping is not what takes you up in the air, that's the birds. <laughs> but, but they flap very gently. And um, if they were not flapping, they would just break off, and that would be rather bad. So it's very good that objects like plane wings are elastic, because without this elasticity, things would actually not work. And, and our world is actually, there are many things in elasticity which are terribly important for, in particular for engineering purposes. Then I decided I want to give you something that you can take home and tell friends if they ask you what have you done today or what have you learned today, anything interesting, or what have you done during lunch. And I want to give you two questions you can take away and you can think about, and these are questions I'm thinking about. So one of those questions is, is the universe a crystal? Um, sounds like a very odd question, but this is roughly speaking what, what I'm working on. And um, someone who is 
with me with this is my PhD student who sits in the very first row here, Nicola, and he works heavily on this with me. Um, another way to put this is a question is, does the universe have an internal structure? So what do I mean by these questions? What do I mean by the question is, is the universe a crystal? It's an odd question to ask because how can it be a crystal? It doesn't look like a crystal. I mean, if you look out in the sky, you see sort of dots, which you call stars, and then there's not much in between them if you don't use a telescope. So what I mean by, by crystal is sort of, I'll, I'll explain this a bit later, but what I mean by an internal structure is when we say something like vacuum or emptiness, we try to say nothing. This is nothing. But modern physics has shown that this nothing is actually not nothing. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So for those of you who have sort of heard of particle physics or quantum field theory, in, in these theories, you can show that the vacuum is actually full of life. Not, not real life, but there's physics going on. Or the famous Hawking black hole radiation is only possible because the vacuum is not really the vacuum. There's stuff there. Out of nothing, you can create two particles, a particle and an antiparticle, and they can destroy each other, and then you have nothing. But this nothing is sort of alive, and there's something happening with this nothingness that we like to call vacuum. And what I'm studying is a theory which tries to put a structure on this vacuum. So let me give you a quick overview of sort of a little bit of astrophysics, or astronomy, I think you should call it back then. So Ptolemy, you see when he approximately lived, this was roughly the solar system that the ancient Greeks had in mind and that they deducted from observations. And if you have a careful look here, this is almost like and what you've learned in school. So obviously the Earth isn't there, but if you think about your, your sort of school astrophysics, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, it's all in the correct order. And it's actually amazing that this structure of the solar system has actually been known for thousands of years. So, and, and what people have done, they just went out into the night sky and every night very, very carefully made observations about individual objects in the night sky. I think it's amazing because we always claim that we have this great knowledge, but these people, due to sort of years of very hard and very precise work of observational skills, they deducted this map of the solar system, which I think is actually amazing because it isn't far off from um, how we view the solar system today. So what I'm trying to say or emphasize is this is actually amazingly good. The only difference or the only thing that isn't quite right and so I cheated when I read this out. So here in the middle is a little picture of the Earth with the moon around us. And you see in there, in this sort of fourth shell, is meant to be the sun. So if we swap Earth and sun in this map around, we are done. And you would think, well, that's easy. Should have only taken a few years to figure this one out. Um, interestingly, it took 1,500 years for us humans to swap two objects. And if you think about it, it's amazing. 1,500 years to do this. And the more I think about it, the more amazing I actually find it. But anyway, let's not get too sidetracked about this. So what happened in these 1,500 years? Well, lots of observations, but I'll talk about them. There was one problem with this model. There was one problem with this model, and this model was, if you assume that the Earth is at the center of the universe that we assumed then, and all the planets are sort of flying around the Earth, you would assume that the individual planets over time would sort of fly just across the sky like this. What happens when you do very careful observations is they fly forward a bit, and then they move back, and then they fly forward again. It's the fancy word for this is the retrograde motion of the planets. And this is really what led to the downfall of this model. If you want to do this correctly, you have to do something which is somewhat unnatural. You put the planet on a circle, which flies around the Earth, and then you put the planet, then you, on this circle you put another circle, and you put the planet on this circle. That doesn't quite work, and then you add more and more circles. These are called epicycles, yield to wonderful pictures. Looks a bit like a spirograph. So if you remember from your childhood, you have this little plastic ring, you put a spirograph in, and then you do this drawing, but what you see in there, if I show you, so the Earth is meant to be in the middle, and if you watch one planet flying in the night sky, you see if it is a circle on a circle, it can make this little loop here, which is precisely what we observe 
in the night sky. Um, there are, of course, problems with this, with this model. And it gets rather complicated, and it gets a bit unnatural. And as observations became better and better, um, astronomers back then realized that probably this model isn't quite right. And the first person to make a significant contribution is Copernicus, who did lots of observations and proposed the so-called heliocentric um, model. So Helios is the Greek word for sun. And he basically did what I said. He just swapped the Earth and the sun around, so 1,500 years later. And this model works incredibly well. What I find quite interesting, um, if you think about the, the role of the church back then, obviously the Catholic Church was sort of the dominant force everywhere. And they wanted the Earth to be the center of the universe. And along came Copernicus and said, ah, it's not quite right. Um, I think he was largely left alone because he lived um, in the northeast of, of Europe. So it wasn't really, he wasn't sort of in the influence of the Roman Catholic Church back then. But interestingly, um, I can tell you an interesting fact. So he lived from 1473 to 1543. Martin Luther was also only born 10 years later and died three years later. And if you put this into context, it's actually not surprising that, this, that these two people actually influenced, um, well, history the way they did. But it took two more people to actually verify this heliocentric model. And these are two astronomers. Well, one is an astronomer, Kepler. Galilei is sort of a scientist who did almost everything. He invented the telescope, for instance, and for very practical purposes. But Kepler was the one who observed the night sky very, very carefully and managed to deduct what we, what we now call Kepler's laws of the gravitational force. And it is actually these two that led to probably the most significant contribution I'm speaking about now. And this is, of course, Newton. So Newton, in the sort of 17th, 18th century, managed to formulate a theory of gravity that correctly describes these laws that Kepler derived. What the most amazing thing is about Newton is he realized, while working on the problem of the motion of the planets, that the mathematics he needed to describe the physics did not exist. So he sat down and invented it all. So all of you who know what calculus is, he just sat down and it was for him a byproduct, a necessary tool to develop a gravitational theory. From today's point of view, this is impossible to, to redo for any scientist. If you now have a problem in physics, you can be pretty sure that, any, that there's a mathematician out there that knows many, much more maths than you do and that can tell you what mathematics exists and doesn't. I think it's unheard of for any modern scientist just sit down and say, okay, I'll invent a whole new host of mathematics, then I do the entire physical theory, and then I sell it to all my colleagues and they say, well done. So, ab absolutely unheard of. So, um, which is really, it's amazing that he has managed to do this. Um, so this is the most, the sort of the most complicated equation I actually write. And the interesting thing is G there is Newton's gravitational constant. So this thing here, and you can actually measure this quite easily in, in, a, in a lab. It's called with a torsion string. You put a few bolts on a torsion string, you can do a relatively simple experiment and measure this. So if you again look at the timeline, there was Ptolemy or the Babylonian sort of up to, well, zero or 100 years BC, and then 1,500 years, nothing. And then you have all these contributions from Copernicus, Kepler, Galilei, Newton, all pretty much clustered together. And of course, once you reinvent nature, in, or if you manage to describe nature and make such significant changes to our views, you don't expect that this just continues. So it's not surprising that there was an almost sort of two, 300 year break. And this is when Einstein came onto the scene. And Einstein changed Fundamentally, the view, we, we view the gravitational force, or the gravitational, you wouldn't call it force anymore, the gravitational law. And his theory is based on this equation that equates a geometry on the left-hand side and a matter on the right-hand side. And again, you have Newton's gravitational constant here featuring very prominently. So let me tell you a little bit of what what this equation means, geometry equals matter. And it is easily, or not easily, but you can explain it with a nice little picture. So instead of having a force which tells 
these two objects, so you have two objects, and Newton would say, well, there's a force between the two, and so they will move towards each other. In Einstein's theory, force is not really a direct concept. It's just the result of something that is happening. So as you see in this picture, you have here depicted the Earth on a little grid. So the grid is representing a four-dimensional space-time, which is not flat. So this is bent. And the idea is you have the Earth, say, in the middle of this sheet, and if you put a second object near it, it would just roll down. So you can try this at home. You take a bed sheet, ask a few friends to hold the corners, throw in a big melon, and then you take a little fruit and roll it. And it will just roll towards the melon. It would feel a force, but the physical reason for the force is, of course, the bending of the bed sheet, or, in this case, the bending of the four-dimensional space-time. So this is somehow, for people back then, this was pretty revolutionary because forces were the key concepts of physics, and all of a sudden someone comes along and tells you there are no forces. They're just sort of side effects of some real physics that is going on. So the, the concept of force becomes obsolete, so this is quite crucial. Um, time and space are no longer separate concepts, so this is what is at the heart of special relativity, which Einstein formulated 10 years before, general relativity. And this is full of these little riddles that you have heard. There's something that's called a twin paradox, and there are others. My favorite one is, imagine you have a ladder that is four meters long, and your garage is only three meters long. How do you get it in the garage? You read a book on special relativity, and it tells you if you run fast enough with your ladder, it will shrink. <laughs> and so you ask a friend to shut the door behind you while you run into the garage. And you can resolve all these riddles. But there, some of them are actually quite, quite nice. The one with the letter is, is my favorite. Um, there's a famous sentence which goes back to Wheeler. So if you have this picture of, of the Earth bending the four-dimensional space-time, then this interaction between the planet that curves the space and maybe another object next to it is not static. It sort of dynamically changes. So as one object moves towards the other, obviously it will change the local shape of the space-time around it. And so then the space-time is different again, which will again result in different motions. So there is a very dynamical interplay which makes these equations quite difficult um, to understand. Um, Einstein's theory was actually quite quickly confirmed. It only took a few years. Very famously, Eddington observed a solar eclipse. And what happens during a solar eclipse, so obviously the sun gets very dark, and if you look carefully next to the corona, you see a few stars appearing because it basically gets dark. And then you compare the position of the stars during an ellipse, and then you wait half, during the eclipse, then you wait half a year later and look at the same star, and it turns out their position has slightly shifted. And the reason for this is that the gravitational pull of the sun slightly bends their light rays. So this was confirmed quite quickly, and nowadays we can measure this very precisely, and we don't have to wait for a solar eclipse. We can use um, radio signals to do this. Um, so this is sort of a very nice picture of a Cassini satellite sending a picture, uh, sending a signal from near Saturn to the Earth, and you see as it gets closer to the sun, the gravitational potential changes, and therefore um, um, the signal is not traveling along a straight line, it's sort of curved. So to get you to the point of explaining what I'm doing, I have to change into a completely different subject, and what I show you now is a sodium crystal. Yeah, salt, what you have at home, you put salt on your food. This is how the thing roughly looks like if you look at it very, very carefully. And you have purple sodium atoms in this crystal, and you have the green chloride atoms, and they form a nice little crystal. Now imagine that there is a signal traveling through this crystal. Then if this crystal traveled for in, if this signal traveled diagonally, so along these purple atoms, then the signal would have sort of a very different experience to traveling, for instance, along the green, so along the chloride atoms, or it would still be very different um, traveling this way, where it would hit <coughs> sodium chloride, sodium chloride, um, um, one after another. So each signal would sort of experience the crystal slightly differently depending on the direction in which this um, signal travels. Um, this is not surprising. If you, I mean, I find it not surprising. So, um, if, imagine you drive through London, and um, two miles in the centre of London during rush hour can take a very long time to travel. If you're out in the countryside, two miles takes only a few minutes to, to travel. Yeah. So the world, as such, I don't think is the same 
if you go from A to B. It depends a lot on what is in between A and B. And this is sort of at the very heart of what we are trying to do. So we say that the world is not isotropic, or at least we assume that for one part of the world it isn't. I mean, the world obviously isn't, but um, what we are trying to do, we are trying to build a theory of gravity that contains a bit that models the possible anisotropy or crystal-like structure of the vacuum. Okay, so um, this is the one hard bit of this talk. I'll show you how the equation looks like, roughly. The equation looks like you have a structure, you multiply it with a geometry, and you get something that is matter. One mathematical fact, if you have a number and you multiply it by one, you get the number back. So if you replace the structure by one, then you have one times geometry, which is geometry, which is, I jump back to one of the other equations, which is nothing but Einstein's equation, okay? So our model contains Einstein's model, provided that you assume that the structure is, in some sense, trivial. It is multiplied by one, which means do nothing, which means no structure. Our model is based on the idea that there is a structure um, which you can incorporate into these equations and which therefore changes the resulting model. Um, so the question is, what is the structure? I, I like to call it the structure of the vacuum. And as I said earlier, so it is really the vacuum. We know that it is, that there is something happening in the vacuum. So the particle physics picture is again that there's some energy in the vacuum and particle pairs can be created or annihilated. But we just want to make the very simple, not very simple, but we want to make the, let's call it simple for now, assumption that the vacuum structure of the universe may be non-trivial, i.e. it may contain something. And the motivation for this is really this crystal. So imagine the vacuum structure of the universe would have some directions along which the gravitational force, for instance, would act differently than along, along others. It, it, it sounds a bit tricky, but it's actually not that much of a, of a crazy concept because the world as such tends to be unisotropic, so it isn't the same in all directions. And all gravitational theories so far have actually assumed that there is no structure. So if you go back to Newton's theory, Newton's theory had no structure about the vacuum or about anything really, except for one mass here, one mass there, and there's a force between the two masses. So there was no structure about the space in between. In Einstein's theory, so if I go back to, to this again, he only said there is a geometry and within this geometry, you can have matter, and then you have an interaction between, in some sense, matter and geometry. So we are trying to say that it is possible to have a theory where you can, in a meaningful way, encode a structure, again, of the vacuum into these equations. And let me show you a little example of what this might do for us. So one of the crucial assumptions, and this actually goes back again, if you start from the Babylonian astronomy over Ptolemy and all the others, um, up to Newton and Einstein, the, the gravitational field around a sort of round, compact object is spherical. It looks roughly like a sphere, and, depend, and independently on where you are with respect to this object, you will feel the same attractive force towards the center of this object. Our model allows, for instance, to change the structure a little bit. So we have the possibility to model a vacuum whereby the gravitational field outside sort of a compact object would not be a sphere, but it could be slightly tilted, more like an ellipsoid. So the two cases are somehow related. So if you imagine the ellipse, or this ellipsoidal object here, and you squash it from the side, it would slowly become a sphere. So in this sense, our model is sort of a, a, is a, a minor modification. It is not entirely different, and it reduces to the known models, provided that you assume that the structure is sort of 
not really there. So you have a very good control about changing this extended theory of gravity that we are proposing into the old theory that is well understood. And we can also do, I mean, this has been known for a long time, you can show very directly that Einstein's theory yields Newton's theory in an appropriate limit. So our theory, therefore, we can go from our theory with vacuum structure, so we can take one step back and we go to Einstein's theory and we can take another step back and go to Newton's theory. So it is really built on top of these theories and it's not saying that anything about the previous theories is, is wrong in any way. So we are just trying to propose a meaningful extension of these theories. I've been running slightly quickly, but um, let me summarize to you our attempt to extend the theory of gravity. So, as I said, so all theories that have so far been proposed in theoretical physics, to the best of my knowledge, that model in any way the gravitational force, they always have the concept of isotropy at the heart, which means all these theories always have at their heart, if you have the gravitational force along one way, it is the same as going along the other way. This is, I think, I'm pretty sure this is true for also string theory, supergravity, all these fancy theories that are usually covered sort of on the title of the new scientist, all those, all those great theories, they always have isotropy at the heart. And we are trying to say that we can actually create a theory which is actually reasonably harmless because our theory doesn't require 26 or 10 dimensions. We don't need, inf we don't need more fields. We don't have hundreds more particles that do something. The only thing we have is a slight additional structure that is not new to physics at all. So crystals and the structure of crystals have been known for a very long time. And the study of um, crystal symmetries has been also known for very long. So we just take a very well-known and old-fashioned concept and use it onto Einstein's theory, sort of we marry them together, and the resulting theory is something that seems to be very different to what people have been studied in the past. So, and therefore we allow, I always say the, the universe, but actually what we do is we allow the vacuum or the universe to have some form of additional structure. So we overlay a structure on top of the vacuum and we can switch the structure off and then we are back to Einstein. The good thing about this is if you are able to have a sort of reasonably conservative extension of the theory and if you can switch it off easily, you can in principle go to the lab and measure it because that is really at the crux of theoretical physics. If you propose a new model, if nobody can verify it or falsify it experimentally, then your model is of course useless, because if nobody can check it, then what can you do with it? I mean, it may be true, but it may not be true, and you can't really do anything with it. So in this theory that we have written down, we are able to, in principle, give this to our experimental colleagues, and they can then say, okay, let's measure these parameters, Worst case scenario is they measure all parameters to be one, and then our structure is one, one times the old thing is the old thing, and then we are back at Einstein. So the only thing we would lose is that all these parameters or all this additional structure would just be confirmed to be trivial, which would be somewhat disappointing, but at least um, it can be done in principle. So this is quite crucial. So we can measure all the additional structure that we put onto the theory, and we can put it to the test. So as I said, it contains in particular general relativity as a special case. And let me tell you a little bit, so I, I said already it can in principle be measured, but I say there uh, a sentence, you can view it a little bit like a fancy spring. What do I mean by this? So one way to model, if, if you go back to your sodium crystal, so one way to model your sodium crystal and how this crystal reacts to, say, a signal, what happens in, in a field called um, um, condensed metaphysics, what people do, you take these individual atoms and you connect them with little springs. And all these springs have a slightly different spring constant, or if you have a very simple model, they all have the same constant. And what will happen if you sort of bash this crystal, it all starts swinging around. And you can actually measure these frequencies by which it swings around, by which it sort of um, oscillates, again, traveling, having these signals traveling through the crystal. So if you imagine that this crystal actually contains sort of little imaginary springs, then in principle with the crystal you can measure these. I mean, 
if you have a normal spring, you pull it a little bit, and then you work out what is the proportionality constant between force and extension. So you can do this on the crystal as well. So in our model, in some sense, if you want to really boil it down to something simple, you can view the structure that we introduced as a very complex spring. And um, what is different about this spring than a normal spring is, firstly, the spring can change in time. So it can get stronger or weaker as the universe evolves. It may also be a different type of spring at any point in the universe. Which, of course, opens the door to a variety of problems because we can't really fly anywhere very far away and measure that spring constant that we are proposing. But in principle, within the solar system, or at least close to the Earth, we should be able to determine this structure that we are overlaying on the theory and come either to the conclusion that there is this structure or there isn't. And while I'm a few minutes too quick, I would like to thank you all for spending your lunch hour with me. And for those of you who are interested to, to look at the actual equations, I've just mentioned the the preprint, which you can all look at. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christian, for a very stimulating discussion. So, we've got time for quite a few questions. And so, gentlemen here, please. Could you wait for the microphone, please? Hi. Um, so in a lot of articles about pop science, uh, you hear about certain scientists who come up with concepts that were more inspired than came from the mathematics. Did you come up with this concept from a moment of inspiration or from the mathematics themselves? That's quite an interesting question. So it's actually a, almost a philosophical question. So as I pointed out, so Newton, for instance, he had to invent all his maths to, to actually do physics. These days, it is slightly the other way around. So mathematicians actually charged ahead and developed an incredible amount of knowledge. And there is a certain group of physicists that now sit down and read math books one after the other and try to find some math that has applications to a physical theory. Um, that's not what I have done, so to answer this part of your question. What happened to me a few years ago, about four or five years ago, a colleague of mine sort of told me about continuum mechanics. It's a well-known subject area. It's actually so well-known that it's hardly taught because it's sort of on the boring side. So I, I don't think at UCL we have actually a course called continuum mechanics. So he just told me that this is very similar. And if you look at the equations, for instance, people who work on general relativity, they like continuum mechanics. It's sort of the objects look the same and you have lots of little indices flying around. And you look at the equations, you feel comfortable. You feel like at home. It's like instead of driving a green car, you drive a red car. So you, you can sort of manage, you know, it's, it's not that different. So, and at some point, I just realized that it should be possible to take this idea of having a structure, which is at the very heart of continuum mechanics. You have materials that have a structure, like the aeroplane wing. And it swings only this way and not that way, because if it swung that way, the aeroplane would come down. So it has to swing this way. And this structure is sort of crucial. So the motivation was really to find a way to model this structure onto the theory of gravity. And in the end, it was actually an almost trivial observation. We just had to look at the equation, and there was one term which at one point cried out, it's me, it's me, change me. And I did. There was something what was G, and I called it C. And that was the whole difference. Um, sounds terribly harmless, but there was just this one term that you can very strongly argue for it being the special case of where there is no structure. So if you write down the equations that give you Einstein's field equation, there's one term that we identified and that we say is actually the term that tells you this is just the most simplest model you can write down, and this is actually the full model. Does that answer your question? Do we, we have a gentleman here? Thank you. Um, you uh, gave the analogy of, um, or two analogies, one as the universe is a, a rugby ball, another as a structured uh, like um, a crystal. 
salt crystal. And uh, you made the point that you can go through NANAE or CLCL or NACL, NACL. Uh, each uh, one would assume was different speeds. Uh, does lights uh, have, in your uh, theory, have, uh, have a constant like Einstein's, or is lights, the speed of light rather, uh, variable? Uh, so the, the main part of the question was, is the speed of the light, does it change over, over um, in, in this geometry or in this model that we have? Well, the answer to the question is, the speed of light is still a constant in our model. And the equation that describes the motion of an object through um, the space-time is actually unchanged directly. So the equation is actually the same. Um, the equation gets changed indirectly because what enters the equation, and sorry, it sounds a bit technical, but what enters the equation is in some sense a solution, and this solution that we put in is actually affected by this structure that we put on top of this space-time. But the speed of light is still a, a constant which is quite sweet about this model. So we are not doing crazy changes. So speed of light is not changing, gravitational constant is not changing, um, all the other things that you can possibly play around with, they're all unaffected, because we put actually a very careful structure on top that actually doesn't fiddle with physics otherwise. This is a strong selling point from my point of view. We have a gentleman. Um, so you described the Newton-Einstein um, structures being completely symmetrical as a sphere, does that imply that the ellipsoid, there's some preferred direction within the universe? Sorry, could you repeat the last bit again? Is there some preferred direction within the universe? Ah, so the question is, is there a preferred direction in the universe? So interest, this is again a tough question. So the interesting bit about this, there, is, there are observations which are usually referred to as WMAP, which is data from a satellite that looks into every point in space and tries to, to measure the temperature in that point. Um, there was at some point some mild indication that this, these results had a preferred direction in the universe, sort of an axis. If you show at the actual data, it seems there are sort of darker spots and you could sort of poke a stick through that and then you would have a preferred direction. But I think current understanding is that that might only be sort of a slight observational thing and not a real effect. Um, would we have a preferred direction? Well, our model allows for it, so that's good. So we can have a preferred direction, and if someone measures a preferred direction and finds no other explanation for it, then our model is very easily able to do this, because we just prescribe the structure, then the universe is of that particular shape. Um, but the, the idea is really, you need to measure what the structure is before you put it into the equations. So we cannot, we cannot prescribe by any other principle what the structure is that we impose. It is like a spring constant. So you have a spring constant and you can go away and you can measure the spring constant or how strong the spring is, in other words. But you can't have a theory that tells you from first principle, if you make this spring in a factory, this is how strong it will be. In, in the end, you measure it. So our structure has to be determined experimentally. We can propose a few, and we can sort of grind through the calculation and show people examples. And one example is precisely where, sort of in Newton's theory, you would get a sphere, and we can easily model a um, sort of a scenario where at, at very large distances, um, this, the gravitational field is more ellipsoidally shaped than spherically shaped. Um, we've got time for one last question, I'm sorry, but the uh, gentleman on this side, please. Uh, no, could you wait for the microphone, please? Um, my question was, what sort of experiments do you envisage which might substantiate uh, your theory? Very good question. What kind of experiments? Um, again, very tough because I'm not an experimentalist. So while I may have some good ideas, it is difficult sometimes to tell people, just do this. Um, there, there are two points to this. So measuring these... Con what we have introduced are actually 10 degrees of freedom. It's quite a lot. Measuring all of this in one go is, I would call this mission impossible. So we can't actually go there. The best we can do is we start with the model, which is close to general relativity, and we say introduce two new degrees of freedom, and then we take this slightly extended model and compare with current data. 
and then make an estimation of what this number is that we put in. So if, if, we, if you were to write this as one plus something new, then hopefully this something new would not be zero because then our model would just be confirming Einstein. But the problem in doing this is, is rather technical. It's, it's quite a bit of hard work and you need experimental physicists to sort of say that they are willing to do this, which we just have to wait for if they're ever stepping forward and say, come on then, let's do it. But um, yeah, this is um, experiments, I think, the, to answer it more precisely, I think current cosmological data is really the one area where you can expect to estimate how, how much support you have for this theory or how little. Thank you. I, I'm afraid we must close now because there's a class going to come in. Um, I'd like to thank everyone very much and welcome you to the next one, which will be on Thursday. If you could please uh, fill in your uh, response sheets and let's thank Christian once more. Thank you. Thank you.